Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Packaging for Beginners workshop here at Fedora Nest. My name is Carl George. I am the uh, Apple team lead for the uh, for the Apple sub team of the Community Platform Engineering Group at Red Hat. Uh, there's my contact info there on the title slide. We've also got Troy Dawson, who is the Apple Steering Committee Chair. Well, you know, what? go ahead and introduce yourself, Troy, and same for Nils. I won't steal your thunder. Oh, that's fine. Uh, I'm Troy Dawson, the Apple Steering Committee Chair. Uh, I also work with Carl on, on some things at Red Hat. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Nils. Yeah, I'm Nils Philipson. I'm an engineer working in CPE, usually doing development. I've been caring, uh, taking care of packages for quite a long time of my career, but that's a while ago. But what held for uh, for that a couple of years ago still holds now. So there we are. Also, you won't be stealing my thunder call because I'll get it like at my doorstep as it looks like. <laughs> so if, if I suddenly jump, then that's that. <laughs> I have to close the windows. All right, well, let me go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, quick plug for the, uh, we have a survey going on. Uh, me and Troy mentioned that we work a lot with Apple, um, which is the Extra Packages for Enterprise Linux repository. Um, this is not part of the workshop at all, just uh, like I said, shameless plug. We got a QR code and a short URL there and the actual full URL if you want to take the survey. Uh, that, that was also dropped in the uh, in the introductory remarks, but I know a lot of people missed the QR code. It went by fairly quickly. Uh, hit Troy or Nils, if one of y'all can copy and paste that link into the chat from the slide deck that we, oh, Diego got it. There we go, perfect. But that is not part of the workshop. I just wanted to mention it again. Uh, that's gonna be open for the month of August for anyone that uh, wants to just open it up and look at it later or bookmark it. So our topics for today, uh, we're going to have a few general topics and then we're also gonna, then we're gonna dive into RPM packaging specific stuff. Uh, for the general topics, we're gonna talk about what is source code, how programs are made, building software from source, patching software, and installing arbitrary artifacts. If any of this stuff you already know, that's great, but we're gonna make sure that everyone has the same baseline you know, some people may have already, you know, say messed with a make file before and they're familiar with that or they know about patching software. But we're going to go through these basics, the fundamental building blocks, just because they're crucial to understanding how packaging works. And then when we get into the actual packaging side, we'll talk about, you know, what is an RPM? What is a spec file? Uh, build roots, RPM macros, the actual building of the RPMs and quality checking them after we've built them. So for this guy, we're going to be following a guide today, uh, roughly. It's uh, part of, it's in the Red Hat developer uh, GitHub group. Uh, we have a link down there at the bottom. If someone could also put that link into the chat, that would be great. Uh, we don't need to have it open today directly. This link, um, this is just the GitHub source for the guide. We'll be, we have a link on an upcoming slide that's an actual PDF that will follow along for this talk. Uh, we're not going to cover every bit and piece of it. The guide covers a lot more things than what we have time to get into today. Uh, it has an appendix full of advanced topics that are really good. Um, if you notice something in there that's not right, it is a it's a living document. You know, pull requests are not just welcome but encouraged. So we'd love to see. Uh, in fact, I'll reference a pull request that I have open right now that I was hoping would get merged by today, so I didn't have to even bring it up, uh, but it did not. So um, we'll talk about that in the prerequisites a little bit. And here is that said PDF that will follow. We've got a QR code and a uh, and a tiny URL, or you can, or someone can drop the link in the chat. That's the actual PDF that we'll be referencing with the page numbers as we go through the workshop today. Once I see that in the chat, I'll go to the next slide. Perfect. That is our link. So our pre prerequisites today. Um, it, I, tr I got it onto the schedule, but not at the very beginning when the schedule was published. I was hoping everyone had a chance to see it. Uh, to do the labs a day, you'll need access to an RPM system, ideally Fedora, CentOS, RHEL, or a RHEL derivative to do the labs. Uh, this can be either the system you're, you're connecting from that you're working off of, or uh, if you have a remote system like a cloud server that you have SSH access into. None of the labs we're doing need anything graphical. They're all terminal-based. So... Um, 
Yes, Carlos, the PDF is made from ASCII doc. Um, I did not set that up. I that uh, the people that originally wrote this guide did, and it is it is pretty nice. Um, so if anyone doesn't have access to uh, one of these types of systems, uh, theoretically, I guess it could work from something like OpenSUSE, but I've never tried it, and I wouldn't. There may be some of the tools that don't work the same way. So uh, ideally, you have access to one of these types of systems. Uh, if you don't, you're still welcome to follow along and ask questions, but uh, I don't. You wouldn't be able to really use the do the labs directly. So, here is our first lab uh, related to the prerequisites. We're going to get a few packages installed to start off with. Um, on page three of that PDF that we linked earlier, there's a list. There's a DNF or yum command to run. One special note. If you're actually uh, doing the lab on a EL8 system, Enterprise Linux 8, which would be RHEL 8 or Alma 8 or CentOS Stream 8, things like that, uh, there's a, a separate step that you need to do to set the default unversion Python. Um, that is in that pull request on GitHub. If nobody has an EL8 system, we don't need to worry about that or talk about it. Uh, this should be a really quick lab, less than five minutes ideally. Uh, I will just... In order to avoid a bunch of plus one messages, uh, I'm going to say I'm done in the chat and just give that a thumbs up, like it or whatever, whenever you've completed the first lab. And once that looks close to the number of people viewing, then we'll uh, move on or ask if there's any questions if anyone's stuck for some reason. This lab's really short, so we're, after we're done with it, we're, we'll keep going. But uh, some of the, the longer labs in the future, we'll, we'll do breaks in conjunction with the labs. So that way, if someone needs a few more minutes to get finished, uh, they can. Or if people want to take you know, a bathroom break or refill or their beverage of choice, they can do that as well. Also, if anyone's having any trouble with any of the setup so far, either getting to the PDF or anything like that, um, feel free to drop a question in the chat. Uh, Troy and Nils are here primarily to field questions while I'm talking and presenting, so that will uh, that is a resource available to everyone. Do not do not worry that you're interrupting me. Uh, I'll still probably glance over at the questions, but I'll do my best to ignore them while I'm discussing a topic, so the presentation flows smoothly. All right, so we're going to get into our general topics and background. Uh, the, so my first thing: uh, what is source code? Um, that th this is going to be talking about things on page seven of the uh, of the PDF. I won't keep calling out the page numbers for the rest of this, but just know that uh, you won't really need that for the presentation right now. But if you wanted to go back later and compare the presentation slides to the PDF uh, packaging guide, you can use those page numbers for reference. So source code is a human friendly representation of instructions for the computer. Uh, the Bash shell is a good example. It's an interactive shell. It's what most people use when they open up a terminal emulator. Uh, it happens to be scriptable like most shells, and its scripting language is, in fact, a programming language. And so it's inst the instructions you type into a Bash shell could be considered source code. That's one simple example. Uh, James, the page number where we should be done through. Uh, don't feel like you need to read through the PDF guide, all the steps of, uh, corresponding to this. Uh, we're just going to do a high-level overview with these with these slides, and the PDF guide is going to be a, ref a reference for future if you wanted to dive deeper into any of the particular topics. So how programs are made. Uh, there's a process called compilation, which is where we take source code and we translate it into a representation the computer understands, either a native computer language or otherwise. Uh, there are different types of execution for programs. We have what's called natively compiled and interpreted, which is divided into two other categories, byte compiled and raw interpreted. We'll talk about those categories a little more on the next slide. So you'll see some logos for popular programming languages there on the right side. And th those correspond to each of these categories that I just mentioned. So for native native builds, natively compiled software, you know, we have things like C, C++, Go, and Rust. 
there's plenty more. I had limited space on the slide for logos. So those are the, the, the top four that I thought were really popular or at least very common in, in our circles. The code, the source code is translated and, or compiled directly into machine code. And then that is executed directly on the system, the, the resulting file that you get. Interpreted or uh, byte compiled interpreted will be things like Python or Java or Ruby. A lot of people might mistake those for raw interpreted languages like Bash because they just see, say, a Python sc script and they run it and they just see that it runs. That it, but, in, but behind the scenes, the interpreter for that, the Python uh, binary, it is translating that source code into an intermediate representation known as bytecode. Um, and it still needs an interpreter to execute. You, you don't just run, say, a Python script or a Ruby file by itself. Then we still, and then we also have raw interpreted as a type. That would be things like how we mentioned Bash, how you can just uh, how it's scriptable. That's that source code is directly interpreted and executed by its runtime, right as it's parsed. Uh, you can even get uh, create interesting uh, side effects and behaviors, uh, like if you b edited a Bash script midway while it was running uh, and timed it right. You could do all kinds of weird things to the computer and sec faults and things like that, where the underlying code changed. And that's how you know that it is being executed line, one line at a time, essentially. Uh, and that also needs an interpreter to execute. You can't just run a bash script, just the file by itself without bash the command. Quick breather here. Uh, does anyone need uh, have any questions related to uh, the types of builds? Uh, or the types of software and source code, what we've gone over so far. I'll pause like this periodically through the uh, through the presentation just to give people a chance to ask questions. But if uh, if you have a question, don't feel like you need to wait for one of those pauses. You can just go ahead and drop it in the chat. We'll handle it as we go. Thank you, Nils, for getting those uh, the PDF of the slides up or in case anyone needs them. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, support team. I love it. All right. So now we're going to talk about building software. Um, so compiling the software, it's a process. Uh, is this a duplicate slide? Do we already cover this? No, it's just very similar. Sorry. The the software compilation process is usually called building. Uh, we have build things called build systems or build tools um, that would be things like Make or Mason that help to automate that process. Natively compiled source code that must be built in order to execute it, as it doesn't have an interpreter to execute otherwise. Uh, Whenever you do a native, comp natively compiled build, the binary that you get to run, it's it's going to be hardware architecture specific. That means like if you if you were to build a build a program on your x86 64 laptop, and then you copied that file over to say an ARC 64 Raspberry Pi, you wouldn't be able to run that binary because the architecture doesn't match. For interpreted source code. It still needs to be built uh, whenever it's byte compiled, not whenever it's raw interpreted. A lot of a lot of these byte compiled languages will automatically do the byte compiling for you. Like I mentioned, how with a Python script, pe some people don't realize that it is byte compiled because they just have an interpreter and a script and they run it and it's abstracted away from them. But it is doing the byte compiling behind the scenes, and we'll look at that a little bit closer in the Python lab we have later on. Some of the other byte compiled languages like Java, you actually have to build that byte code by hand directly. It's not done automatically for you. So patching software. A software patch is a lot like if you think of a cloth patch that's used to repair clothing like a shirt or a blanket. A software patch kind of works like that. It's something that we'll apply on top of other source code either to repair a defect or add a new function of, for something that was missing previously. This comes into play a lot for RPM packages because we'll find ourselves in a situation where 
we want to fix something or add some kind of functionality for the version that we're packaging uh, without necessarily updating the package to the next version from the upstream project. Uh, that may be a case of like backporting a security fix or a feature. It may be a case where the upstream has already made that change, but not it's not in a released version yet. Or they may have made the change and released it in a in an incompatible version. Say we we want to add a feature or fix to version one of the software that we have packaged. Upstream has come out with version two that has that fe fix or feature. Um, and from the upstream project, you don't have a way to get that fixer feature without doing the incompatible upgrade to version two. Patching is a way we could cherry pick out that one change and put apply it to version one of the software that we're putting in package. We In that patch mechanism, we still keep the original source code. Uh, Pristine uh, will have a tarball containing the source code for the main primary version from the upstream that we're packaging. We keep that around and keep that separate from patches for several reasons. It helps with auditability, reproducibility, and debugging especially. Debugging is a real big one. If you run into some kind of problem, uh, being able to turn individual patches on and off and redo the builds uh, comes in really handy. All right, I guess not. We'll go ahead and move on. If anyone has any questions later, just feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, we can get an answer there, or go back a slide if we need to. Installing artifacts. So on a Linux system, we'll want to install um, artifacts once they've been built. That involves putting the file in the correct place according to, and correct being defined by what we call the file system hierarchy standard, the FHS. That defines directory structure, and it also defines the context for arbitrary files based on what location they're in. You can just look at a file and know that, okay, well, if this is in slash Etsy, that's a configuration file. Or if it's in user bin, that is a command that I want to run and things like that. Um, it's not just logical context of what you're looking at, but also things like SC Linux context come into play. If you're familiar with that from other things in work and whatnot. We have a tool available to us called the install command. It's part, it comes from GNU core utils. And it, it we're, we use that pretty heavily with RPM packaging. Um, it copies files into their destination, but it has a few benefits over the copy command in that you, it can also, in one command, you can set uh, ownership and permissions and things like that right away. So it, it's, it's usually the preferred way to get files in the lo location we need for doing the package build. So that concludes our general topics for... Uh, our overview. If we have any questions about those, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Uh, the next slide, next thing we're going to get into is the actual RPM packaging guide itself. I'll pause for a minute just to give anyone a chance to ask questions if they have them. Yeah, one aside to the install command is very often that is wrapped in the make file or uh similar construct where you then can type make install it will run the install commands for you and in install the the various files of the program in the right place absolutely that is a great thing to point out and i'm not seeing any questions come through so we'll go ahead and move along with rpm packaging guide So what is an RPM package? It is a file that contains other files and metadata about them. Uh, more specifically, drilling down, there's a lead 96 bytes of magic that we don't actually use anymore. It's just kept there for backwards compatibility. There's a typically a digital signature that's optional. Then there's also the RPM header that contains all the metadata about the package, which we'll get into that metadata on future slides as well. And then it also contains uh, a CPIO archive, which is an older format uh, of an archive. It's not really, I've never used it, seen it used for anything else but RPMs, um, but it contains the actual payload, which are the files that we're gonna be installing on the target system when you install that RPM. So 
So one of the during the prerequisite lab, we installed a thing called RPM Dev Tools. That includes a command called RPM Dev Dash Setup Tree. If you run that on your system, uh, don't get ahead. That's actually the next lab, which is another one of the easy labs. When you run that command on your system, it creates these directories. Uh, it creates an RPM build directory, and within there, build RPM sources, specs, and source RPMs. And that is exactly what we're going to do in this next less than five minute lab. On your uh, on your target system, just run that command. It should be available. If it's not available, then make sure you have the RPM Dev Tools package installed, and then that'll give you that command. The uh, the page numbers in this in the slides they reference the page numbers that are printed in the uh, printed on the PDF pages, not the actual number from the application that you're viewing it with. That's a good thing to point out. Imagine, imagine it's I'm a book. I'm looking at these two and I'm going, they're not the same. <laughs> <laughs> so Robbie asked an interesting question here. Uh, is it not recommended to build RPMs as a separate user anymore? I've always had a special non-privileged user for building. Um, we're going through the this uh, with the base. We're going to be doing our labs with just the basic RPM build command. Uh, I wouldn't even recommend using that uh, you know, quote unquote, in production later on after this, we'll talk about mock later on uh, towards the end of the end of the workshop, uh, which mock has its own uh, its own special sep setup for doing the separation of concerns there. Uh, I don't think there's a problem with doing RPM builds as your normal user. Uh, you definitely don't want to do them as the root user. Uh, do, doing RPM builds as the root user. If you were to have, it's possible to have errors in your spec file that can can affect and damage your actual system that you're running things on. Um, doing it as a non-root user, even the primary user you run as, uh, limits that potential impact. Running it inside Podman is also another option. Yeah, the main thing, I, it doesn't have to be a separate user, It's just, as long as you're not root. <laughs> Unless your primary user is root, if you just log in directly as root. <laughs> I've seen people do that. <laughs> We've got seven thumbs up on the I'm done. I think we had eight thumbs up on the on the first prerequisite lab, so I think that's most everyone. Does anyone need more time to run this one command and get their uh, directory structure set up? So I think we're about good, and we'll move on with the uh, with this. So we're going to talk about spec files. What is a spec file? It is a recipe or set of instructions to tell RPM build how to actually build the RPM. By the way, in case we didn't mention this yet, RPM build is an act is an actual command on your system that you can run that we're going to we're going to use later in labs. Uh, that does the actual work of building the RPM. It, the spec file is going to be composed of various sections and headings. Uh, it's going to have metadata. This is where you specify the metadata that we mentioned gets embedded into the RPM later. It's also going to have build instructions and a file manifest. This is where, in the metadata, this is also where we define the name, the version, and the release of the package. This is a really common uh, set of data together that we refer to as NVR. That gets used as an identifier for a lot of things, it gets used as the identifier for the build when you're doing it in a build system. It's also used for comparing packages uh, with the package manager on your system to determine what packages that are available are actual upgrades for what you have installed. Uh, here's a simple example that I got off of a Fedora 36 system from the bash package. You can kind of look at this and split it on the hyphens. Um, split it on the hyphens from the right into three groups, so that way, if you had, you could, it's still allowed to have hyphens in the package name, but it, going from the right, if you split that off to, at a hyphen, you get two dot fc thirty six. That is the release of the package. Then the five one sixteen, that is the version of the package, and then everything else, bash in this case, is the name of the package. The version is going to correspond to the upstream version from the software project bash in this case. 
the release, that is sort of like a different version number. Um, it's sort of like the version of the package as opposed to the version of the software that's being packaged. Uh, another way you might look at that is that is the it, this would be the second attempt at packaging version 5116 from the upstream. That's needed a lot of times if you need it, if you need to make package changes or rebuild a package, but not change the version. So this, the very first section of the spec file is what we call the preamble. Um, this is some of the stuff that I already mentioned. We've got the name, the version and release. We also have a summary, uh, which will be just a short summary of what the package contains. We'll have the license field that lets us set the uh, set the, the define the license of what of the software that's being packaged. We're not defining that. We're identifying it. What's defined upstream? We also set the the URL for the like the software project or the software vendor's website, and we'll also list out our source and patch files. The source is going to be uh, the the source that most packages are going to have is going to be a path or URL to an archive of the software source code. Uh, we can also specify additional sources, uh, things like uh, if we have to carry our own configuration file or systemd unit file, anything like that can be specific that's separate from the upstream project. For whatever reason, we can carry that as a source in our spec file. Then we also have patches. Uh, any 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 changes that we need to make to, to the software when, while we're building it, we can include those in this preamble section. It's really common to see the source and patch directives numbered, like source zero, source one, patches, patch zero, patch one, patch two, but it's actually not required anymore. Uh, so you could just do source repeatedly or patch repeatedly. They're numbered internally and you can still reference them by numbers, but you don't have to actually specify the number yourself. So we have a few more items that are common in the preamble. Um, so a lot of these are optional. Um, you can play around with spec files and figure out how, how many of these you can actually leave out entirely. Uh, it gets to a point where it won't actually build, but uh, most of these you'll have defined uh, typically. Uh, build arch, that's, only gonna, that's really only used now. Nowadays when you have an architecture independent package, what we call no arch, um, that would be something like if you were packaging a bash script and you know that that is just a text file that gets run by the bash interpreter that's already on the system separate from your package. That means the package you create isn't going to be limited to a specific architecture because it's just that bash script. So you can create a no arch package that works everywhere. We'll also be able to specify build requires here. Those are going to be packages that must be installed on the system building the package. That's different from requires which are packages that must be installed on the system where you're installing the package at. Um, we'll often refer to these as build time versus runtime requirements. Another, another two more directives around architectures are exclude arch and exclusive arch. Uh, those, those are a lot less common. You sh most of the time won't have to deal with those. The architecture for your package is going to match the build system that you build it on. Um, typically what we'll have in say Fedora, you'll build a package, you won't specify anything about architecture. And as long as it's not no arch, it will do multiple builds for every supported architecture and you'll get different packages that correspond to each architecture. Uh, with exclude arch and exclusive arch, you can do special things where you either uh, allow list or deny list basically the architectures if you needed to, for, to have that level of control. Um, some examples might be uh, if there's upstream software that flat out doesn't work or isn't supported on a specific specific architecture, uh, you can exclude it. Um, sometimes you may want to uh, just skip the test suite on a particular architecture, which is separate from these directives. These these directives define where you can actually build it, um, but we'll get into the conditionals later. I'm getting ahead of myself. Does anyone have any questions around preamble items that we've gone over here? Jonathan's asking us to reiterate the source and patch part, uh, the patch number part. So, and a lot of the templates and guides and most of the documentation you see online, 
you'll see things listed out like source zero as the URL for the archive of room software, and it's a source one for a system you know, and it's two. You can just leave those numbers off entirely. They source repeatedly, you know, and uh, they're numbered internally in the order that they're listed in the spec file, and so you can still reference them by number, but you can just leave the numbers off. They're optional on this part. Oh, sounds cutting off again. This internet out here is really bad. I apologize for that. Yeah, it's uh, going bad again. Yeah, sorry about the uh, the bad internet connection I have. I uh, actually agreed to do some dog sitting out in the country before this uh, before the conference was scheduled, and so I'm just trying to make do as uh, as best I can. Apologies. If so, I end up dropping off entirely, uh, Troy and Mills will just have to pick up the slack and take over for me. But hopefully, we can avoid that. I just wanted to point out, since we were asked about source and patch, um, I think we can't do this later on, but those go into the the sources directory. There's a spec directory, there's a build and whatever. Both the source and the patch go into the sources directory. But I think that is we correct. can do that later on. We we will explore that in more detail in uh, in the labs as well. I okay. that is a great thing to point out. I guess we could very briefly look at that uh, that directory tree. So the when you do the RPM dev setup tree command, you get your build directory. That's where sources are unpacked and things are intermediate files are compiled and things like that. Um, the RPMs directory is where the final RPMs, you know, instead of going in alphabetical order, let me go in the order of the build kind of. Uh, your specs directory is going to have your spec file uh, or spec files. Your sources directory is going to have all those sources and patch files like Troy mentioned. The When you when you do your build, uh, we'll, we're going to do it in two stages. You can do it in one step, but uh, for the lab purposes, we're going to do them separate. When you build, you build your source RPM first, that's going to be a special kind of RPM. You don't install those on your system. That is a, it's an RPM that that contains the spec file, all the sources and all the patches and can be reused to build a, what we call a binary RPM, the traditional usage of the word RPM for different systems. Uh, after your build with RPM build, those are going to go, uh, go into the RPMs directory. The build directory is that intermediate step. It's where uh, the software sources, the source tarballs are uh, extracted and where all the build steps are take take place as the working directory. Hey, we've got a celebrity here. Adam's here. He uh, This is actually his original source material that I have uh, shamelessly stolen. So thanks a bunch, Adam. <laughs> Let's get back to where we were. All right. So that was our uh, preamble section. Um, that was a great point, Troy, about the sources and patches being in the same sources directory. <laughs> So if there's no other, I'm, I don't know if there was any other uh, questions I missed in the chat. Um, let me scan that real quick. Adam was just saying that license was was free anyway, so you can't steal what's free. <laughs> Excellent point. I like that phrase. Omar said he asked one and I missed it. Yeah, the the, the oh. Apple one like that's uh, oh yes advanced, advanced material. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll touch on EPOG briefly uh, in the uh, towards the end. Um, hopefully, you never don't, have to use them. <laughs> don't use EPOG. <laughs> no, unless you have to use it. Unless you have to, you will know when you have to. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. All right. So I mentioned how they, we the spec file is kind of divided into the preamble part. There's also the body of the spec file. That's where we're going to have a description. Uh, it's a little bit more verbose version of the summary. Uh, we'll it can be multi-paragraph, multi-line, uh, and sometimes some packages don't really have much more to say about them, and people will just shortcut that and take the uh, use the summary as the description as well. Just add a period to the end to make it a sentence or a sentence fragment, and that's fine too. But it's it's a place where you can go into greater detail on the um, on the software itself of what you're packaging. 
we also have the prep section. That is going to be where we prepare the source code for being built. That involves unpacking any of the, the archive or the archives. If there's more than one, that's where we're going to apply our patches at. Um, sometimes we need to delete files or make small modifications to files without, uh, without using a patch, but just, you know, say you, you could use like sed on a file in the prep to make a small change to it. Uh, those are really common things. Then we have our build section. That's where the commands for actually building the software into machine code for compiled languages or byte code for the byte compiled interpreted languages. That's where that takes place. We also have our install section, and that's gonna be where we take the files that we've built and we place them into the appropriate file system locations, but it's relative to our build root directory. Uh, the build root is kind of where we stage all of the files uh, for the final RPM. We don't, wouldn't do that on our actual system because remember we said we're not gonna be building as root. Uh, and also you don't wanna put them on your system. You want to put them into a, a separate directory that gets uh, compressed together into that CPIO archive and then gets put into the final RPM. Another section we'll have is the check section. Um, this one is optional. Uh, some of the other ones are optional as well, depending on what you're doing. Um, check is one that very often becomes optional. Uh, a lot of upstream software doesn't have test suites. Uh, and that's what this section is for. It's where you want to run, uh, run commands to test the software, such as the upstream test suite. Some software doesn't have a test suite. Sometimes it doesn't work correctly or uh, it has known failures. Uh, I would recommend when you can skipping individual tests rather than not running the test at all. Uh, but that's that gets into best practices later on. For now, we're just going to cover that that is, where, that is where the section where you're going to run the test if you're doing that. We also have a file section. Uh, that is where we're going to list out the files, kind of like a manifest of what's going to be installed on the target system. Um, so that way, you can just look at a spec file and you'll know what files would be con would be contained if everything builds correctly and the spec files written correctly, you'll know what's going to be uh, installed in that final RPM. That's a good way to keep track of changes in the upstream software. If they say, say they started to include a new file out of their build and it conflicts with what you have in the file manifest, that's a way to notify you the build would start failing because you would have an additional file in your build route that you don't have listed in files. And it's a good way to just sit, make sure that the package has the files that you're expecting to be there. The next section is the change log, and that's usually the very last section of the spec file. Uh, that's where we're going to record changes that have happened to the package between different versions and releases. Uh, one thing I see new packages get confused with here oftentimes is uh, the difference between this and the upstream change log. You don't actually have to you don't have to duplicate the entire upstream change log in the RPM change log, and most packagers don't. Um, it is a useful place to talk about packaging changes. Um, upstream changes oftentimes just get summarized as you know latest upstream release or latest upstream version. But it is also it is sometimes uh, you'll see people call out specific upstream changes uh, that are worth that are notable in the change log. Uh, the real common example is CVE fixes. Those will often get put into a, an RPM spec file change log just so that way people know which version of the package they need, need to upgrade to in order to resolve that relevant CVE. All right, RPM macros. These are going, these are variables that are used for text substitution. Um, there are more advanced macros that uh, use a programming language called Lua. But at the end of the day, their, their end goal is still to substitute text in into somewhere in the spec file. Uh, so it may be some it may be programmatically generated text, or it may just be a direct text. You know, this is this this key is this value. Uh, they can be conditional, which means that they'll only be expanded if the macro uh, only expand the macro if some other condition is true. They can you can also explore these outside of an RPM build, actual RPM build context on your on your test system. Uh, we don't have a lab for this, but if you wanted to play with this on your own, you can run the RPM dash dash eval command. That will, and then that takes arguments and you can ask it, 
what a specific macro is defined as um, to evaluate that macro. You can also combine that with the RPM dash dash define flag, uh, and that lets you define a macro either for its own sake or to influence other macros that are being evaluated. Um, when you're doing it ad hoc on the command line, that de defining it doesn't do anything other than something that you're evaluating in the same command. Uh, then there's a really useful command called uh, rpm dash dash show rc, and that'll print out all the makers you have defined on your system. Uh, it's quite a lot. You'll probably want to pipe that into a grep or a less command in order to look for exactly uh, either just page through it or to look for a very specific uh, specific macro. That comes in handy a lot of times if you know there's a macro that you're looking for, but you don't remember exactly the syntax for it, or you thought you remembered and you're getting errors that it's not defined. You can run that to, to see exactly how it's defined. You might have forgotten an underscore or something or spelt something wrong, and that comes in very handy. So here's some of the common macros uh, that we'll use. Uh, they're very common for file system locations. Uh, for example, underscore bender evaluates to user bin. Um, there's uh, underscore libexec.dir that'll evaluate to user libexec. There's a whole lot of uh, file system location prefixes like this that we'll use. Um, prefix is another one that evaluates to slash user. The uh, and I don't think I covered this yet, but macros, that's the kind of the syntax right there. It'll be a percent and typically a, a curly bracket around the actual name of the macro. Um, there, are, there are scenarios where you wouldn't, use, wouldn't need to use the curly brackets. Um, they're, they're kind of, they work kind of like curly brackets in Bash, if you're familiar with that, where you could do dollar $foo in Bash, and that works as a variable name to expand the variable. Uh, but if you needed to... Uh, separate that from other other strings, you could use the curly brackets to say this is where the, the maker name ends. A lot of people will just use those curly brackets regardless, just out of uh, just for consistency, and that's that's fine and understood as well. Makers are often a lot of times used for distribution properties as well. Uh, on a CentOS stream system, for example, you could expand CentOS and you'll get the value of nine on CentOS stream nine. Um, you can use EL9 on the same system and you'll get a value of one. Uh, if you were on a not on an EL9 system, that would not evaluate at all. <clears throat> then the dist macro, before I mentioned the NVR of a bash package, how it had FC36 <clears throat> as part of that release string. Um, that's what's called a dist tag. And that's typically used to, to provide an indication of what release of a distribution that uh, the release of that package was built for. Uh, that's a very common way to help avoid installing, say, a rel 8 package on rel 9 or vice versa or any other combination. There are <clears throat> there are several there's some situations where you could have a dist independent package, um, but they're rare and you should kind of avoid them anyways. You really want to use packages that were built and targeted specifically for the release that you're using. And yes, I'm seeing some stuff fly by in the chat about other distributions like you know percent Fedora, percent rel. Those are those are real common macros to find too. I just I just grabbed three off of a uh, off of a CentOS nine system that I was looking at. Yeah, when we're, these are we're these are one. ones that you can also explore with that RPM show RC command. One word about those that that are may not be defined, like what you mentioned before, the conditional macro expansion. That's when this comes in very handy because um, if you use a macro that isn't defined, it will just expand to the macro name, which is a bit like unexpected. Yes, and if that's in an, in a context like build where it's trying to execute, you'll get a strange uh, you'll get a very strange error message about. Uh, foreground control, I believe, which there's something in Bash with the percent sign where it tries to do, uh, I think it's, is it at jobs or something similar? Um, so if, if your build log has it trying to execute, you know, say an EL9 command, you know that something's funky and it's not being defined right. The way to handle that, there's a syntax you can use where you put a question mark 
before the maker o name, and then it will uh, that will expand it if it's defined and make it an empty string if it's not defined. That avoids dumping the macro uh, syntax into into the build context wherever you're at. Just like Nils dropped down there in the uh, in the chat, there's other other things you can do there too with say a colon after the uh, the macro name, which will let you do something else if it's defined. And you can even use there's an exclamation point you can put next to the question mark to set to say do insert this string if it if it's not defined. Lots of different controls and things you can do there. All right. So working with spec files. A big part of packaging software and RPMs is editing the spec file itself. That's where most of our work takes place. Most packagers, we don't create spec files completely from scratch. We're going to use built-in templates from our text editor, or there's a command that came with the RPM Dev tools package called RPM Dev New Spec. That'll create kind of a skeleton of a spec file with your preamble and body sections. It won't be valid from the get-go. There'll be empty sections that need to be filled out. There may be some lines that you don't need. Uh, for example, it'll have a, a build requires line that's empty. If you don't actually have any build requires for your package, then you can just remove that line entirely. But that gives you the basic template of what you need uh, to create everything. There's nothing wrong with writing a spec file, file from scratch if that's what you want to do. There's just there's faster ways to do it. So we are going to get into the next lab. Uh, this is going to be about a five minute lab and it's going to be working with spec files. On page 25 of the guide, not of the PDF, slide PDF, but of the actual packaging guide PDF and the page number that's printed in the document, not the one from your PDF reader, there is, uh, there's instructions there for tarballs and patch files. Uh, go ahead and download those on your working system and place place them into the RPM build sources directory. Uh, we're going to be, this is set up for uh, three example labs we're doing, uh, or three example programs we're going to build as labs later on. So you're going to have sources for uh, a Bello, a Pello, and a Cello package. Those are all Hello World examples written in uh, different programming languages, which you can probably guess by the first letter that they're that they start with. In this lab, we're going to use that RPM Dev new spec command. Uh, with all the instructions, the actual commands are listed there in the guide. And so in addition to getting the, our sources and patch files, we're also going to run RPM Dev new spec, new spec to create the template and start filling in values uh, for, those for those packages that we build later. We're going to spend about five minutes on that. And... Uh, I've been talking for a little while now, so I'm going to, we're also going to do a break. Uh, let's say a 10 minute break after, um, after the lab's done. And then we'll move on from there. Just so I don't lose track of time, I'll set a timer for 15 minutes. So a five minute lab and a 10 minute break, uh, and then we'll get back started. Uh, some, some of us will still, I'll, I'm just going to go to the bathroom and come back. Uh, I don't know. If Troy and Nils are going to be here the whole time, but uh, someone will be here to answer questions if you want to drop anything in the chat. And have fun. See, Jonathan made a really good point. Uh, we were talking about this the other day, and I meant to mention it in this lab, so I'm glad he brought it up in the comments. Um, the RPM Dev new spec command, it has a dash T option that lets you specify a template. A lot of those are kind of old and not really well maintained uh, and don't necessarily comply with all modern package guidelines. So. Uh, they're there, you can use them, but don't just assume that everything in that template is going to be correct for what you're doing or modern. Like that, that's one, one thing you'll, uh, you'll have a couple there. Yeah, you'll, you'll have regularly if you maintain a package in, in, in Fedora or Apple for a while that you are going to be updating your spec files to the, respective current standards like if new macros are introduced 
or all macros are deprecated and removed eventually. One really good thing with uh, RPM packaging is that it's been around for a while. It's been around for a long time and a lot of things will keep working for a long time in the future until they're eventually deprecated. Just because they keep working doesn't necessarily mean that they're still the best practice. The best practices do kind of evolve and change over time. RPM gets new features, um, package guidelines change. And so some of those things you just kind of have to, you know, participate and be active in the, in the community to be aware of those, you know, bookmark and reread uh, package guidelines when you're trying to do something. If you don't remember a uh, particular syntax of a spec file, particular section of a spec file, go check the guidelines for it and see if, um, see if anything's changed. Um, there's really not a great way to be aware of these. Maybe pay attention to uh, release notes for RPM upstream if you're really into it. So a couple of things, uh, other things here in the comments, there was a, uh, yes, there's a lot of older guides online. Um, and yes, it would be nice to have this, uh, give this PDF to our past selves. I agree. Uh, Link asked a question about what the dash Q option is in setup. That just stands for quiet. Uh, it's kind of the default. And there's a, there's a newer macro. Um, I believe the, RPM dev new spec, it gives you the, there's an example of one of those things, best practices that changes over time. Uh, it'll do a percent setup and then a uh, dash Q for quiet. Leaving off the Q doesn't do anything. It's fine. It just prints a few more things in the log. Um, but a more modern example is to use uh, percent auto setup. And that'll have the benefit of automatically apl applying any patch files you have specified in the package. Uh, and it does a setup dash Q quiet by default without you having to specify the flag manually. For this lab, it's fine. You don't have to do the auto setup. You can just leave it as setup dash Q. Or if you want to, you could do auto setup, but you'll have to uh, adapt to the instructions around patch. There's one, one, one of the labs has a patch file, and you'll have to adapt uh, to that and make sure you know what you're doing. I would, re I would recommend doing just sticking with the setup dash Q for now. I mentioned the packaging guidelines. I'll drop a link for those here in the chat. I'm curious if auto setup is mentioned in there, and it is. I'll explain it in greater detail. So Mark asked, why not auto setup? Um, auto setup is great if you know you're going to apply all your patches. If you need to have any kind of granularity around which patches are applied, say you only want to apply a particular patch on a particular architecture, or you're sharing a spec file between Fedora and RHEL, and you only want to apply the patch on RHEL because of an older library, but not on Fedora, that's a, that is a use case where you'd want to use setup and then put conditionals around the patch application lines. Um, for, this, uh, for these labs in particular, uh, we're going to stick with setup instead of auto setup just because that's what the PDF is written for. And um, and so we're just going to stick with that for consistency. If you really feel strongly that the that the guide should focus on auto setup first, which I think there's a good case that it should, uh, that, is a, that is an example of something that could be contributed to the uh, upstream ASCII doc sources to get that updated. Nils, I don't know if you were uh, listening at the time, but Troy said he was going to uh, go take a break also and then try and come back and join from Chrome and see if it works better for him. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't, uh, didn't get that. He'll, he'll join us again shortly, I'm sure. Oh, and there, there he is. is. I'm, I'm back, and both of you sound much better now. Yeah, I thought it was the whole, everybody else's problem. <laughs> I had a strange issue in the uh, Fedora Museum during one of the socials yesterday where uh, I guess my slow connection was doing some kind of weird uh, side effects in Jitsi where to me it looked like my camera was on and everyone else's camera was off. But when I mentioned it, everyone people told me, no, everyone else's camera is on, your camera is off. <laughs> Which was quite weird. I'm not even sure how one would go about troubleshooting that. All right. 
it has been, uh, my timer has one more minute of it, of the break, and then we'll get going on. I did some quick math for the rest of the, uh, the rest of the slides in the labs, and it looks like I've talked a little bit too long on uh, the introduction stuff. So to, uh, I did this the last time I gave this presentation to, two hours is really cutting it kind of close. You got to really be on top of it to get, get through all the material in two hours with breaks. The alternative would be two hours straight through with no breaks, but that's no fun. So I, honestly, I think what we're going to do is uh, we'll skip one of the three Hello World examples. Um, they're all useful, but uh, for the purposes of this, we can probably cut one of them out. Uh, if you still want to do it later on on your own, uh, you'll have all the material. You'll have these, these presentation slides as well as the packaging guide. You can follow through the packaging guide front to back on your own, with, and it'll have more material and all of the, uh, all of the labs. <laughs> I don't want to call it homework, um, but if, uh, if you want to call it homework, that's fine. Uh, I mean, we're all at home right now as a virtual conference, I guess. So it's all homework, but um, we'll probably just do the Bash and C example uh, programs, Bello and Cello. Uh, we'll skip the Pello one for now. Uh, I think that one takes just a little bit longer because you're having to man manually deal with the byte code, uh, which is a very interesting thing to do. If uh, if these type of labs uh, tickle your fancy, if they if they catch your interest, I would recommend doing it again on your own. Uh, I'm not sure if we have anything scheduled directly after us or another break on the schedule. Um, I think we're the last thing in the of the day. Oh. There, there is a, there is another like uh, when when our two hours are over, there's a break of half an hour or something, and there's another short uh, block of uh, social hour, well, uh, social half hour, really. Well, I don't want to deprive anyone of the social stuff, so rather than go trying to go like, over, like we we, we have half an hour, half an hour of wiggle room. Okay. Oh, okay. So we're already that late. Okay. Um. Yeah, totally. Missed the time. We'll, we'll go. We'll go ahead and cut out the. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you when when we get to the next. Uh, when we get to the Pello lab, we'll skip over that one and just do Bello and Cello. So, uh, so I'm t our time. Our lab and uh, break time is over. I should have just done a shorter break. Uh, looks like we've got about six thumbs up on the uh, on Diego's "I'm done" comment. So I'll assume that pretty much everyone's done with this lab, and we'll move on. And here is our. Uh, Here's our first program. This is a Hello World program written in Bash. Uh, we're going to write a spec file for it. Uh, we already created, uh, we're going to finish filling out the spec file for it. We started the spec file with RPM Dev New Spec in the previous lab. And then uh, we'll spend, um, let's, uh, let's check in at 10 minutes and see if we can short, uh, shortcut this one a little bit. Uh, but it'll be pages 26 through 31 in the, in the PDF guide. Uh, you don't need to go past page 31. That's where the, uh, the bellow part ends and the next uh, example begins. Um, but all the commands are listed there in that PDF. First, just go through and uh, we'll work on that for the next, uh, let's say, 10 minutes and then check and see if we need five more after that. And just like before, I'll leave an I'm done comment just like that whenever you've, you've uh, completed this part of the lab. And of course, if anything in the guide doesn't make sense or you have any questions at all, feel free to drop them in the chat. Carol, I just want to be clarifying because some of the letters sound familiar. We are doing the bellow with a B for bash. And what was the other one we're doing? Uh, cello, which is a C okay. for C. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the uh, this is the bellow one. The next one is, yeah, the pillow is the one we're going to skip. Oops, no, go backwards. Yeah, so we just have these three after a row. We'll, we'll do the first and the third one here, but for now, everyone just hand, uh, go ahead and go through pages 26 to 31, follow those instructions in the PDF guide, and then that'll be our, our Bellow spec file. Carlos went ahead and went, went ahead to page 43. So the... Uh, Yes, I guess if you uh, if you want to squeeze in the Pello spec file and you can do it between uh, between the, this one and the other lab, then uh, there's nothing stopping you. 
for some people, this stuff will make perfect sense and they'll just buzz right through it. For other people, they might need a little more time or have questions, and that's totally fine too. Everything's new, new to you until it isn't anymore. I guess I will. I'm going to go ahead and describe the uh, the next lab, just for anyone that wants to get started with it. If anyone still needs to work with the Bellow spec file a little bit longer, uh, go ahead and do that. Oh, we have a quick question here. Regarding the line install dash m and then the rest of those arguments, um, is the extra slash needed? Okay, I see what you're saying, Robbie. And you are correct that um, build root, the build root uh, macro, that doesn't end in a slash. But the binder macro, which evaluates to user bin, does start with a slash. So the slash between build root and binder is not needed. Um, so you could actually skip that one. The other ones you do need the slash. So like between binder and name, name doesn't have a slash in it and binder doesn't end in a slash. So you do need that one. Um, really it's just, just, the, uh, just before the binder, you don't need that slash. It doesn't hurt anything to have it in there. So, uh, but that actually would be a good little typo fix for the, uh, for the pack new guide. We can, uh, I'll grab that GitHub link again, just like in, just like in the shell, multiple, uh, multiple consecutive slashes, uh, get squished down to a single one. So it doesn't actually hurt anything, but I do agree. That would be a good little thing to clean up just from, uh, from an OCD perspective. All right, so this was the uh, that was the Bello Lab. Let's talk about the uh, Cello Lab. Remember, we're gonna we're gonna skip over the whoops, we're gonna skip over the Pello, the Python example for now, just be just due to time. Uh, and we're just gonna do the the Cello spec file. So in this example, we'll write the spec file for the Cello program. It's an example Hello World program written in C. And we'll we'll spend uh, let's do the same thing. Uh, work on this straight for about 10 minutes and then see how, where everyone's at if people want a few more minutes. And if anyone needs to finish up uh, the Bello spec file or has any questions or anything they're stuck on there, uh, feel free to shout out questions in the chat and we'll help you get caught up. And the page numbers here is uh, pages 39 through 44. Uh, so try to try to limit yourself to just those pages as you're going through. We'll, after this, we'll get into the lab of actually building the RPMs, uh, the real fun stuff where everything hits the fan. And remember, please, if anyone has questions at all, uh, there's no no dumb question except the one you don't ask. Um, I know I've done this workshop one time live, and it was really nice because people could raise their hand, have one of the trainers come over and just uh, ask them one on one directly, not in front of the you know in front of the whole class per se. Uh, we don't really have that luxury with uh, with Hoppin, but um, so like I said, don't don't be afraid of asking questions. Ask away if anything's not clear in the uh, in, in the guide. We'd definitely like to have feedback on it. Um, I kind of jokingly kept pushing people to to submit you know pull requests to the to the ASCII doc sources for the packaging guide PDF, um, but I am trying to make note of those things as we go. And if that drops off someone's plate, if they're not able to do that, those are changes that I'd like to eventually make sure get in there because I I agree with what I've heard so far. Yeah. Speaking of that, I guess somebody did ask a question and I I groaned at it. The epoch. Um, <laughs> let's let's just do a quick summary of what an epoch is. Sure. While people are doing that's not first. So, that's not frustrating with the question. Frustration with the question. That's frustration with epochs in general. <laughs> yeah. Um, an epoch, so we have our version, that's the version of your software. We have the release, which is usually we consider it the release of the RPM. So if, as you change spec files or add patches, you do the releases. An epoch is sort of uh, a trump card. And I'm not meaning Donald Trump. I wish his name was not. But um, I don't know what, uh, what else to call it. And that might be an American term. But basically... Super version. Super. Oh, that's much better. Thank you. Um, I, I know what you mean by trump card with that. Like I've played spades. It, I know what you mean, but <laughs> yeah, it's it's 
it, it's above everything and you don't use it unless things happen what the most common use for an epoch is uh when a package version goes from like a year to a to a number like let's say it's package was 2022.4 and now they're sw saying hey we want to go to six you know drop the year uh well six is much lower than two, 2022 so you would switch the version to six and then add by default epoch has a version of zero so you would add an epoch one and then that six would technically because the epoch is one so version six epoch of one is higher than a version of 2022. so that's when you would use the epoch um, the, the problem is every once in a while you find somebody using the epoch incorrectly and for the most part if you can get away with not using the epoch don't use it because you can never take them out to rephrase it another way it is a tool a very big hammer if you will for forcing the sorting order for versions. Yep. Um, and like like Troy mentioned, you 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 generally want to avoid that. You once you put it in there, you can never upgrade it, or you can never remove it without ruining your upgrade path. So uh, there have been there are some packages in Fedora that have ridiculously high epoch numbers, things that have should have never have been reached uh, because of various mistakes and misuse of epoch. So. Uh, in general, you want to avoid it. Hopefully, you never have to interact with it. But if you get in a situation where the upstream the upstream versions change in a way that uh, RPM doesn't understand it as a, a proper upgrade, if you need to force it, that's what Epoch is for. Oh, is that one of the high ones, Neil? Epoch Bind has an Epoch of 32, apparently, which is, it should never happen. Yeah, th thankfully, Epoch is an integer number, so we can go a little higher than that. <laughs> yes. I think Perl has a really high Epoch as well. Or I may be thinking of a Perl packet, a, a Perl component that was like that. All right, we've been going for a little over 10 minutes for this, uh, for this lab. Um, I think I dropped an I'm done comment earlier. Let's see how many thumbs up we have on that. Or did I not put one in there? I'll just go ahead and do another one there at the uh, at the bottom. And if you're already done with this cello lab, just give that a like. Once we get a good number of uh, good number on there, we'll go ahead and go forward and actually start building some stuff. We're up to five. I think that's the majority of people that have been. Uh, Thumbs up in these. Does anyone specifically need a few more minutes to wrap up this or the or the Bello spec file lab? Remember, we're skipping the Pello one, the Python example. If nobody mentions anything in the chat, I'll assume that we've we're down to five people actively following along with the lab, and that's okay. Uh, we'll just focus on getting those people, those five people, a good experience, and uh, move on to the next lab. So building RPMs, everything we've done up to now, we're just preparing ourselves to run the actual RPM build command. Uh, we've covered how to build software from source code, how arbitrary artifacts are built from source code, um, how, they're, how those artifacts built are installed. Uh, and we've talked about preparing our RPM build environment and how to instruct RPM what to do via the spec file. We are going to, next we're gonna use RPM, uh, we're gonna use RPM build to build source RPMs as well as binary RPMs. I touched on that briefly before, but the source RPMs, that is a, it's a similar uh, file structure, but instead of, it has all of your sources and patch files as well as the spec file. And it's a way where you can ship around a unit that has everything you need to build installable RPMs. Alrighty, so we're, uh, we talked about uh, we're going to use RPM build to build our source RPMs as well as our binary RPMs. Uh, we're also going to explore some aspects of RPM build that might be a little surprising. So here's our next lab. Um, 
and just like before we said this the slot this actually should be allocated for 15 minutes but let's go for 10 minutes and see where how far people get um, in this lab we're going to build binary so binary rpms and, and source rpms for uh, bellow and cello we're going to skip hello in this case and make sure you only run the rpm build commands as a non-root user because errors in your spec file can have a negative effect on the system you're performing the build on. We've got our page numbers there uh, for the guide, pages 44 through 47. Uh, go ahead and run through those uh, those steps in there, and uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat as they come up. So we are just about out of time. So let's go ahead and move forward and finish up what we can. We'll go a little over, but that's okay. Quality check in RPMs. Uh, RPM lint is a tool, is a linter tool uh, for spec files, source RPMs and RPMs. Uh, it can report common packaging errors. And Fedora 35 has RPM lint version two. Uh, if you're on a Fedora 35 and up system, which most people I saw on the poll are using Fedora, so you better, you should be on 35 or higher because 34 is end of life. So that has RPM Lint version two. The output doesn't match the examples in the guide. Uh, that's another example of something that would be a really welcome contribution uh, to that guide, an explanation of how uh, maybe updating the examples to match for Fedora uh, so that way people don't have unexpected uh, output in those examples. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Troy. And here's our last lab. Um, this is uh, just checking those spec files and source RPMs and RPMs that we built, uh, checking them for quality with RPM build. That's another thing that I, I'm looking to, I'm hoping to improve on that I haven't done yet. Is I'd like to, uh, I believe in the packaging guide, it uses the term sanity check, which uh, some people don't like that phrasing. There's, um, it's not the nicest phrasing if you consider some of the connotations around it. So quality checking is just a more accurate term anyways, rather than sanity. So that's something that I'm personally going to work on uh, at some point in the future, getting a pull request together to um, make that terminology more accurate to what we're doing. So, Carl, your slide says RPM build, but the labs are RPM lint. Oh, that's correct. That is a typo in the slides. Very sorry about that. Oh, and Diego just pointed that out too. <laughs> I just wanted to double check to make sure I wasn't looking at the wrong lab. No, you're correct. That is a typo. And if you're Personally, looking at the live, if you're looking at the live slides, I just fixed it. But if you're looking at the PDF <laughs> export, we'll need to export it one more time for the, that fix. The only way I could get it to fit on the screen really good without taking my whole screen is I'm, this is on a PDF. Okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm we'll uh, we'll fix that for the uh, we'll re-export one more time before we submit it for the conference collection of slide decks. Okay. It is fixed. In fact, I think we're we're technically out of time for the presentation, the two hours. Um, so let's go ahead and make the uh, the quality checking, the RPM lint stuff. We'll leave that as an exercise to the reader, homework, if you will. If you optional homework, you don't have to turn anything in. Um, just like the Pello exercise, if you wanted to take a look at that and uh, learn a little bit more about Python bytecode and how how you can handle that manually. Um, it's a good example for learning learning about bytecode. It's not very useful in real world because uh, we have macros that handle lots of the Python bytecode specifics, so you don't have to really think about it at that level. It's more of a more of a learning example than anything. Um, but let's go ahead and go on to the advanced topics real quick. I'll just talk on those and wrap everything up. So in the packaging guide, uh, pages fifty-two through seventy-four. Uh, well, the entire packaging guide is going to be a resource for your packaging adventures after this workshop's over. Um, those advanced topics are have additional things that you that you could learn about. Uh, they go over things like mock, disk git, defining your own macros, epochs, which we talked a little bit about earlier, 
uh, scriptlets, and conditionals. Uh, in particular, the one thing I do want to call out explicitly that you should definitely read up about, that if this were a three-hour workshop, I would have a lab, a lab specifically on it, uh, is mock. Which, go ahead and go to the next slide. Yes, I agree with Neil that uh, once you learn mock, you'll never go back to playing RP and build. Uh, Troy told me the other day he actually run, cheroots, uses mock to open up the cheroot and then runs RP and build manually in that. But I don't know anyone else that runs RP and build manually directly or indirectly. Um, I say indirectly. Everyone's doing it by running mock. But anyways, mock itself. Um, so there are a few drawbacks of using RP and build directly like we've been doing in these labs. Your build requirements have to be installed on the system where you're running RPM build. And the a build requirement that is already installed, it's really easy to forget to list that in your spec file. Uh, you may, you'll may you forget to list it, but your build succeeds. And you don't document that build requirement because it's already installed. And it's just kind of a, a mismatch there. Um, additionally, you can only build RPMs uh, that target the same operating system and release. Uh, it's not 100% true you could create packages that technically work, but they are more working by accident rather than intention. And they'll be, in most situations, uh, you don't want to do that because the resulting packages won't install correctly or they're inst installed and have problems. So Mock is a tool that actually solves all of these things for us. It, it, uh, it'll set up your build requirements uh, into a cheroot, not on your main system. Though, and then you it'll build it'll actually run RPM build um, inside of that root. That lets you build RPMs for uh, different operating systems and releases than the one that you're running on your system. Additionally, those roots they're automatically created for you and removed, so you don't even have to think about them. Uh, you don't have to worry about, say, you know, a compiler that pulls in a lot of dependencies that you don't really want installed on your main system. They'll get installed in that root and automatically cleaned up, and they won't be polluting your list of system packages. Um, modern modern versions of Mock also are actually using containers, not just uh, plain cheroots, um, and that that has additional isolation benefits. But uh, for most of your packaging work, I highly recommend using Mock rather than uh, than RPM build directly for all of these reasons listed here. Uh, Mock is also used by Fedora's Koji build system and in the Copper build system as well. It's pretty well pretty well and much standard across, uh, at least across the Red Hat ecosystem. I'm sure Neil will comment if, uh, if OpenSUSE is using it in their ecosystem as well. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Troy. I think that's it. Yep, that's all, folks. That is uh, That is our workshop for today. Uh, sorry, I didn't manage the time quite appropriately with uh, to get to that that Pello lab, or to spend more time on the RPM lint. But uh, two hours is what we had a time limit for. We also had a little bit of interruptions with my own pack, my own uh, connection issues, and I again I apologize for that. But thanks for attending the workshop. I hope you got something out of it. If you have any questions in the future, uh, all the presenters here we're happy to happy to talk in public channels. We had our uh, contact info on the beginning slide, which will be in the uh, the slide export that we do later. Um, we're in the common channels for Fedora. There's uh, Fedora Devil on IRC. Uh, there's Apple on IRC. There's also corresponding matrix channels. And uh, the Fedora discussion uh, discourse has also different, uh, you can start different topics in there if you have other packaging questions. And of course, uh, the old, the old, old fallback of uh, regular mailing lists, if you want to ask questions there. We welcome in, welcome those questions and hope to help uh, help you get get along in your packaging adventures in the future. I guess now it's time to head over to the uh, social in the Fedora Museum. So y'all have a good one and thanks for coming to the workshop. workshop. Bye. Bye everybody.